Today I'm reading chapter four of this book, The Creation of Consciousness, Jung's Myth for Modern Man, written by Dr. Edward F. Edinger. Chapter four, The Transformation of God. We all must do just what Christ did. We must make our experiment. C.G. Jung from C.G. Jung Speaking. To those unacquainted with Jung's empirical psychological method, this chapter may be open to misunderstanding. It may sound like theology, but it is not. It is, in fact, empirical psychology. The confusion comes in the use of the terms which have traditional religious connotations. Why then use these terms? It is necessary to do so in order to demonstrate the psychological facts which underlie religious conceptions. Moreover, there is scarcely any other way to communicate such material. The objective psyche was first experienced and described in a religious metaphysical context. Hence, traditional religious images are our richest source of data concerning the objective psyche. Depth psychology, however, melts down the dogmatic structures which were the traditional containers of these images and recasts them in modern molds of understanding. According to the psychological standpoint, man cannot get outside his own psyche. All experience is therefore psychic experience. This means that it is impossible, experientially, to distinguish between God and the God image in the psyche. My use of the term God in this chapter, therefore, always refers to the God image in the psyche, i.e. the self. On June 30, 1956, Jung wrote the remarkable letter referred to at the end of chapter 3, in which he speaks of the continuing incarnation and the transformation of God. Elenid Kochnig had asked him, quote, for an answer to the problem of an unconscious, ignorant creator God, and if this did not imply, quote, some principle, some ground of being beyond such a demiurge, end quote, end quote. Jung's reply, written in English, is a most profound document which deserves our closest scrutiny. In that letter, Jung writes, speaking of Christ, quote, He was up against an unpredictable and lawless God who would need a most drastic sacrifice to appease his wrath, that is, the slaughter of his own son. Curiously enough, as on the one hand his self-sacrifice means admission of the Father's amoral nature, he taught, on the other hand, a new image of God, namely that of a loving father in whom there is no darkness. This enormous antinomy needs some explanation. It needed the assertion that he was the son of the father, i.e. the incarnation of the deity in man. As a consequence, the sacrifice was a self-destruction of the amoral God, incarnated in a mortal body. Thus, the sacrifice takes on the aspect of a highly moral deed, of a self-punishment, as it were. Inasmuch as Christ is understood to be the second person of the Trinity, the self-sacrifice is the evidence of God's goodness, at least so far as human beings are concerned. We don't know whether there are other inhabited worlds where the same divine evolution also has taken place. It is thinkable that there are many inhabited worlds in different stages of development where God has not yet undergone the transformation through incarnation. However that may be, for us earthly beings, the incarnation has taken place and we have become participants in the divine nature and presumably heirs of the tendency toward goodness and at the same time subject to the inevitable self-punishment. As Jung was not a mere spectator of divine unconsciousness, but fell a victim to this momentous manifestation, 
In the case of incarnation, we also become involved in the consequences, as Job was not a mere spectator of divine unconsciousness, but fell a victim to this momentous manifestation. In the case of incarnation, we also become involved in the consequences of that transformation. Inasmuch as God proves his goodness through self-sacrifice, he is incarnated. But in view of his infinity and the presumably different stages of cosmic development we don't know of, how much of God, if this is not too human an argument, has been transformed? In this case, it can be expected that we are going to contact spheres of a not yet transformed God when our consciousness begins to extend into the sphere of the unconscious. This is at all events a definite expectation of this kind expressed in Evangelicum Eternum of the revelations containing the message, Fear God, Revelation 14, 6 through 7. Although the divine incarnation is a cosmic and absolute event, it only manifests empirically in those relatively few individuals capable of enough consciousness to make ethical decisions, i.e. to decide for the good. Therefore, God can be called good only in as much as he is able to manifest his goodness in individuals. His moral quality depends upon individuals. That is why he incarnates. Individuation and individual existence are indispensable for the transformation of God, the Creator. Unquote. In this passage, Jung gives a psychological interpretation of the Christian myth and explains how that myth applies to modern man. However, the statement is so condensed that it requires both commentary and amplification to make it generally accessible. I would draw your attention particularly to the statement, quote, it can be expected that we are going to contact spheres of not yet transformed God when our consciousness begins to extend into the sphere of the unconscious. Unquote. This remark is the source of the title for this chapter. As Jung demonstrates in answer to Job, Yahweh is an unpredictable and lawless God who often falls into fits of rage and jealousy. The Old Testament documents this fact thoroughly, and it is demonstrated empirically in anyone who has an encounter in depth with the object of psyche. According to the symbolism of the Christian myth, Christ's sacrifice changed the nature of Yahweh. By offering himself as an object upon which the divine wrath can vent itself, Christ proclaims a benevolent God of love and brings redemption to man from the wrathful God. Like a heroic soldier who throws himself on a live grenade and thereby rescues his company at the cost of his own life, so Christ allows himself to be blasted by the wrath of God in order to redeem his fellow men. This sacrificial act not only redeems man, but also transforms Yahweh. With his explosive rage spent by the innocent victim's voluntary acceptance of it, Yahweh is transformed into a God of love through the example of a loving man. The situation is complicated by the fact that Christ is not only a man, but also is considered to be the Son of God. Thus, Christ's self-sacrifice is simultaneously God's sacrifice of himself, or, as Jung says, a self-destruction of the amoral God incarnated in a mortal body. It seems as though God can undergo transformation only by being incarnated in man. He needs a mirror of himself in mortal form to bring the consciousness required for change. And what mortal can serve that mighty aim but one who perceives himself as the Son of God, i.e., an agent of divinity?
In other words, the ego is given the strength and purpose to stand against the primitive self through awareness of his sonship with the self, which confers a sense of partnership in the mutual process of transformation. The theme of the transformation of God did not first appear with the advent of Christ. As Jung has pointed out in answer to Job, Job's encounter with Yahweh brought about such a transformation. The Old Testament also provides us with other examples of the transformation of God through his encounter with conscious man. In Genesis, Yahweh is contemplating the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham exhorts God to be just in these words, quote, Are you really going to destroy the just man with the sinner? Perhaps there are 50 just men in the town. Will you really overwhelm them? Will you not spare the place for the 50 just men in it? Do not think of doing such a thing. To kill the just man with the sinner, treating just and sinner alike. Do not think of it. Will the judge of the whole earth not administer justice? Yahweh replied, If at Sodom I find 50 just men in the town, I will spare the whole place because of them. Abraham replied, I am bold indeed to speak like this to my Lord, I who am dust and ashes. But perhaps the fifty just men lack five. Will you destroy the whole city for five? No, he replied, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five just men there. Again Abraham said to him, Perhaps there will only be forty there. I will not do it, he replied, for the sake of the forty. Abraham said, I trust my Lord will not be angry, but give me leave to speak. Perhaps there will only be thirty there. I will not do it, he replied, if I find thirty there. He said, I am bold indeed to speak like this, but perhaps there will only be twenty there. I will not destroy it, he replied, for the sake of the twenty. He said, I trust my Lord will not be angry if I speak once more. Perhaps there will only be ten. I will not destroy it, he replied, for the sake of the ten. Genesis 18, 23 through 32, the Jerusalem Bible. As a result of this encounter, a righteous remnant, Lot and his family, are rescued from the doomed city of Sodom. In Numbers, Yahweh is enraged at the rebellion of the Israelites and threatens to destroy the entire nation by pestilence. Moses remonstrates successfully as follows, quote, But the Egyptians already know that you, by your own power, have brought this people out from their midst. They have said as much to the inhabitants of this country. They already know that you, Yahweh, are in the midst of this people, and that you show yourself to them face to face, that it is you, Yahweh, whose cloud stands over them, that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you destroy this people now as if it were one man, then the nations who have heard about you will say, Yahweh is not able to bring this people into the land he swore to give them, and so he has slaughtered them in the wilderness. No, my Lord, it is now you must display your power according to those words you spoke. Yahweh is slow to anger and rich in graciousness, forgiving faults and transgressions, and yet letting nothing go unchecked punishing the father's fault in the sons to the third and fourth generation. In the abundance, then, of your graciousness, forgive the sin of this people, as you have done from Egypt until now. Yahweh said, I forgive them as you ask. Numbers 14, 13 to 20, the Jerusalem Bible. Most instructive of all is the mysterious account of the sacrifice of Isaac, also referred to as the Akedah, or binding of Isaac. Quote, 
It happened some time later that God put Abraham to the test. Abraham, Abraham, he called. Here I am, he replied. Take your son, God said, your only child Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him as a burnt offering. On a mountain I will point out to you. Rising early next morning, Abraham saddled his ass and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. He chopped wood for the burnt offering and started on his journey to the place God had pointed out to him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, loaded it on Isaac, and carried in his own hands the fire and the knife. Then the two of them set out together. Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham. Father, he said. Yes, my son, he replied. Look, he said, here at the fire. Here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, my son, God himself, will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Then the two of them went on together. When they arrived at the place God had pointed out to him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood. Then he bound his son Isaac and put him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and seized the knife to kill his son. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, he said. I am here, he replied. Do not raise your hand against the boy, the angel said. Do not harm him, for now I know you fear God. You have not refused me your son, your only son. Then looking up, Abraham saw a ram caught by its horns in a bush. Abraham took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Genesis 22, 1 through 14, the Jerusalem Bible. Embedded in this text, I see a symbolic description of the process of the transformation of God. The clue of this interpretation is the fact that the divine name changes in the course of the account. At the beginning, the divine name is Elohim, i.e. God. At the end of the story, when Abraham is restrained from sacrificing Isaac, the name news is Yahweh. From the standpoint of biblical criticism, this means that two different documents, the E and the J documents, have been combined to make the canonical text. However, from the standpoint of empirical psychology, which reads the dream or scripture as it stands, it means that a transformation of the deity has occurred. The same thing is indicated by the fact that God has changed his mind and no longer wants Isaac to be sacrificed. The text begins with the statement that God put Abraham to the test. What is the nature of that test? Abraham was caught between two different levels of divine manifestation, a primitive God, Elohim, requiring human sacrifice, and a more differentiated and merciful God, Yahweh. One biblical scholar notes, in Abraham's day, the sacrifice of the firstborn was a common practice among the Semitic races and was regarded as the most pleasing service which men could offer to their deities. It was the giving of their firstborn for their transgression, the first of their body for the sin of their soul. Micah 6, 7. Abraham is in the fearful position of having to mediate between two developmental levels of deity. That is his test. The primitive level of deity is represented by the ram, which, according to legend, was grazing in paradise before it was transported to the thicket on Mount Moriah. The ram signifies unregenerate archetypal energy, which must be extracted from the unconscious and sacrificed. Abraham is participating in a process of divine transformation 
by permitting himself to entertain murderous impulses against Isaac. This brings the ram energy into consciousness where it can then be sacrificed under the aegis of the more differentiated aspect of God. Psychologically, one might say that Abraham's test, whether he was willing to risk a conscious encounter with his primitive effects in the faith that they are capable of transformation. The Church Fathers considered Isaac to be a prefiguration of Christ. For instance, Augustine says that Isaac himself carried to the place of sacrifice the wood on which he was to be offered up, just as the Lord himself carried his own cross. Also the ram caught by the horns in the thicket. What then did he represent but Jesus, who before he was offered up, was crowned with thorns by the Jews. According to this association, Yahweh's test of Abraham is to determine whether Abraham is willing to share Yahweh's later ordeal of sacrificing his son, Christ. Abraham is asked to participate in the tragic drama of divine transformation. He assents, allowing it to be said of Abraham as well as of Yahweh, that he loved so much that he gave his only son, John 3, 16, Jerusalem Bible. Before leaving Old Testament imagery, I want to draw your attention to a remarkable passage in Ezekiel. Yahweh is speaking. He has been complaining to Ezekiel about the sins of Israel and threatening to destroy the nation in punishment. Then he says, quote, I have been looking for someone among them to build a wall and man the breach in front of me to defend the country and prevent me from destroying it, but I have not found anyone. Hence, I have discharged my anger on them. I have destroyed them in the fire of my fury. Ezekiel 22, 30-31, the Jerusalem Bible. From this we learn that Yahweh actively seeks a man who will stand up to his attack and defend the breach in the defensive boundaries of the ego. Yahweh is asking to be resisted in his wrathful, destructive side in order that his primitive aspect can undergo transformation. Martin Luther quotes this passage from Ezekiel and adds that the strong hedge or wall is the upright prayer of a godly Christian. In psychological language, this means that active imagination by an ego, which is related to the self, will help to transform the primitive effects of the primordial psyche. Certain figures in Greek mythology are also victims of the drama of divine transformation. Robert Graves gives us an example of the following account of the myth of Tantalus. Quote, Tantalus was the intimate friend of Zeus, who admitted him to Olympian banquets of nectar and ambrosia, until good fortune turning his head, he betrayed Zeus's secrets and stole the divine food to share among his friends. Before this crime could be discovered, he committed a worse. Having called the Olympians to a banquet on Mount Sipolis, or it may have been at Corinth, Tantalus found that the food in his larder was insufficient for the company and either to test Zeus's omniscience or merely to demonstrate his goodwill, cut up his son Pelops and added the pieces to the stew prepared for them as the sons of Lycaon had done with their brother Nyctimus, which then entertained Zeus in Arcadia. None of the gods failed to notice what was on their trenchers, or to recoil in horror, except Demeter, who, being dazed by her loss of Persephone, ate the flesh from the left shoulder. For these two crimes, Tantalus was punished with the ruin of his kingdom, and after his death by Zeus's own hand, with eternal torment in the company of Ixion, Sisyphus, Titius, the Dynads, and others. Now he hangs perennially consumed by thirst and hunger, 
from the bough of a fruit tree which leans over a marshy lake. Its waves lap against his waist and sometimes reach his chin, yet whenever he bends down to drink, they slip away and nothing remains but the black mud at his feet, or if he ever succeeds in scooping up a handful of water, it slips through his fingers before he can do more than wet his cracked lips, leaving him thirstier than ever. The tree is laden with pears, shiny apples, sweet figs, ripe olives and pomegranates, which dangle against his shoulders but whenever he reaches for the luscious fruit, a gust of wind whirls them out of his reach. Moreover, an enormous stone, a crag from Mount Sipolis, overhangs the tree and eternally threatens to crush Tantalus's skull. Unquote. Tantalus was admitted into fellowship with the gods, i.e., he represents an ego which has made intimate contact with the transpersonal psyche and has become privy to the secret beyond the epistemological curtain. This makes him a participant in the drama of divine transformation. Like Isaac, he is caught between two successive stages in the evolution of God. Zeus is in a state of transition out of cannibalism, reading between the lines of the myth which comes down to us in a late recension. We can make out the outlines of a primitive deity who requires human sacrifice and whose food is human flesh. The flesh of Pelops serves as divine ambrosia. A symbolic parallel is the flesh of Christ, which constitutes the Eucharist feast of the Mass. Tantalus, having feasted with the gods, knows their secret menu and offers it to them. The gods, perceiving their cannibalistic shadow in the mirror of their human counterpart, recoil in horror and project their newly perceived shadow onto Tantalus. Tantalus thus becomes the scapegoat of the gods, an instrument for the increase of divine consciousness, at the cost of his own torment. The punishment of Tantalus is to be perpetually tantalized. His desire is forever excited and forever denied. This image of simultaneous arousal and frustration has a precise parallel in alchemy. In Splendor Solus by Solomon Tremosin, the stages of the transformation process are depicted in a series of seven pictures representing the sealed and crowned Vas Hermetis, the first picture opposite, shows a sealed vessel within which is a fiery dragon tended by a naked child or homunculus. In the child's right hand is a bottle from which he is pouring water down the dragon's throat. In his left hand is a bellows with which he is fanning the flame. The text speaks of opening the holes and cracks of the earth to receive the influence of fire and water. The picture illustrates the operation of the opposites, fire and water being applied simultaneously. This is exactly what happens to Tantalus. His desire is simultaneously inflamed and extinguished. The primitive, desirous aspect of the transpersonal psyche collides with the spiritual principle of restraint and self-denial, and Tantalus becomes a living crucible for the transformation of God. Another example is Sisyphus, whose name means the very wise one, or perhaps divinely wise. His story is as follows. One day Zeus abducted Agena, daughter of the river god Isippus. He took her to the isle of Ainun, where he raped her. Sisyphus happened to witness this event, and he gave the information to Isippus in return for a spring of fresh water, the Perine Spring, for revealing divine secrets. Quote, Sisyphus was given an exemplary punishment. The judges of the dead showed him a huge block of stone, identical in size with that into which 
Zeus had turned himself when fleeing from Isopus and ordered him to roll it up the brow of a hill and topple it down the farther slope. He has never yet succeeded in doing so. As soon as he almost reached the summit, he is forced back by the weight of the shameless stone, which bounces to the very bottom once more, where he wearily retrieves it and must begin all over again. Though sweat bathes his limbs, and a cloud of dust rises above his head. Unquote. It is Sisyphus's knowledge of the nature of Zeus that harnesses him to his perpetual burden. The account I have quoted explicitly identifies the stone of Sisyphus with Zeus. The same conclusion can be extracted from another tradition, according to Robert Graves. Quote, Sisyphus's shameless stone was originally a sun disk, and the hill up which he rolled it is the vault of heaven. This made a familiar enough icon. The existence of a Corinthian sun cult is well established. Helios and Aphrodite are said to have held the Acropolis in succession and shared a temple there. Palsenius 2, 4, 7. Moreover, Sisyphus is invariably placed next to Ixion in Tartarus, and Ixion's fire wheel is a symbol of the sun." Unquote. Zeus and Helios are alternative images for deity. In either case, mortal Sisyphus is burdened with a task beyond his power to consummate. Because he has seen God, Sisyphus becomes a carrier of the divine burden. He saw Zeus as kidnapper and rapist, and it was this insight into divine darkness that imposed the intolerable burden upon him. Sisyphus's consciousness of God had the effect of an incarnation. As mover of the sun, Sisyphus shares the task of the creator in bringing forth the light. God is incarnated in Sisyphus, who in the midst of his torture participates in the transformation of God. He enhances the light, rolls the sun disk, by carrying awareness of the darkness of God. The transformation of God is also the secret and essential meaning of alchemy, the prima materia which was to be transformed into the philosopher's stone by the alchemical process was sometimes identified explicitly with God. An occasional text even draws a parallel between the alchemical transformation and the Passion of Christ, as in this outstanding example. Quote, and firstly, it is here to be noted that the sages have called this decomposed product, on account of its blackness, the raven's head, in the same way, Christ, Isaiah 53, had no form nor comeliness, was the vilest of all men, full of griefs and sicknesses, and so despised that men even hid their faces from him, and he was esteemed as nothing. Yea, in the 22nd Psalm of the Vulgate Bible, he complains of this, that he is a worm and no man, the laughingstock and contempt of the people, Indeed, it is not unfitly compared with Christ when the putrefied body of the sun lies dead, inactive, like ashes in the bottom of the file, until as a result of greater heat, its soul by degrees and little by little descends to it again, and once more infuses moisten and saturates the decaying and all but dead body and preserves it from total destruction. So also did it happen to Christ himself, when at the Mount of Olives and on the cross he was roasted by the fire of the divine wrath, Matthew 26, 27, and complained that he was utterly deserted by his heavenly Father, yet nonetheless was always, as is wont to happen, also to an earthly body through assiduous care and nourishing, comforted and strengthened, Matthew 4, Luke 22, and so to speak, imbued, nourished, and supported with divine nectar, 
yea, when at last in his most sacred passion, and at the hour of death his strength and his very spirit were completely withdrawn from him, and he went down to the lowest and deepest parts below the earth. Acts 1, Ephesians 1, 1 Peter 3. Yet even there he was preserved, refreshed, and by the power of the eternal Godhead, raised up again, quickened, and glorified. Romans 14. When finally his spirit, with its body dead in the sepulchre, obtained a perfect and indissoluble union through his most joyful resurrection and victorious ascension into heaven as Lord and Christ, Matthew 28, and was exalted, Mark 16, to the right hand of the Father, with whom through the power and virtue of the Holy Spirit as true God and man, he reigns and rules over all things in equal power and glory, Psalm 8. And by his most powerful word preserveth and upholdeth all things, Hebrews 1, and maketh all things one, Acts 17. And this wondrous union and divine exaltation, angels and men, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, Philippians 2, 1 Peter 1, can scarce comprehend, far less meditate upon, without fear and terror. And this virtue, power, and roseate tincture is able even now to change and tint and yet more perfectly to cure and heal us sinful men in body and soul, of which things we shall have more to say below. Thus, then, we have briefly and simply considered the unique heavenly foundation and cornerstone Jesus Christ, that is to say, how he is compared and united with the earthly philosophical stone of the sages, whose material and preparation, as we have heard, is an outstanding type and lifelike image of the incarnation of Christ." Unquote. Note that this text equates the creation of the philosopher's stone with the incarnation of God in Christ. From here it is but a step to the equation of individuation with divine incarnation. The passage quoted links the alchemical procedure with the torturous ordeal of Christ. We have already noted that Tantalus and Sisyphus endured torture as a consequence of their knowledge of the deity. Another example of the connection between torture and transformation is found in the visions of Zosimos, a work of early Greek alchemy discussed by Jung. In these visions, the alchemical transformation process is pictured as a human torture. In a dream, Zosimos encounters a figure who speaks to him as follows, quote, I am Ion, the priest of the inner sanctuaries, and I submit myself to an unendurable torment. For there came one in haste at early morning, who overpowered me and pierced me through with the sword, and dismembered me in accordance with the rule of harmony, and he drew off the skin of my head with the sword which he wielded with strength, and mingled the bones with the pieces of flesh, and caused them to burn in the fire of the art, till I perceived by the transformations of the body that I had become spirit. And that is my unendurable torment. And even as he spoke thus, and I held him by force to converse with me, his eyes became as blood, and he spewed forth all his own flesh, and I saw how he changed into the opposite of himself, into a mutilated anthroparian, and he tore his flesh with his own teeth and sank into himself." Unquote. Other images in the text include boilings, burnings, and dismemberments for the purpose of turning body into spirit, and to make the eyes clairvoyant and raise the dead. I refer to this grisly text because it is an alchemical parallel to the torture figures of Greek myth, and also because Jung gives us an explicit comment 
on the meaning of Zosimos' torture dreams. Quote, the drama shows how the divine process of change manifests itself to our human understanding and how man experiences it as punishment, torment, death, and transfiguration. The dreamer describes how a man would act and what he would have to suffer if he were drawn into the cycle of the death and rebirth of the gods, and what effect the Deus Absconditus would have if a mortal man should succeed by his art in setting free the guardian of the spirits from his dark dwelling. Unquote. Jung was such a mortal man who succeeded by his art in setting free the guardian of the spirits from his dark dwelling, and he suffered the torture of that accomplishment. As previously noted, when Jung was once asked how he could live with the knowledge he had recorded in answer to Job, he replied, I live in my deepest hell, and from there I cannot fall any further. A dream has come to my attention that is relevant to our theme. It was dreamt by a woman who was later to become a Jungian analyst. Quote, a young boy is in his father's laboratory stealing secrets. He is quiet and deadly serious. The laboratory is in semi-darkness, but the boy knows where to go to get what he wants. The father discovers the boy and punishes him by burying him alive. The father then sits beside the grave and awaits the time when the boy can be let out of his earth grave. This takes place on a kind of dark lunar landscape. The father will only allow himself to be seen from the back. One cannot look at the face of the father. The son is then exhumed and sits in a semi-dark room at a desk. He has dark circles under his eye. It is as if this drama of stealing and burial has occurred many, many times. It seems to be as hard on the father as it is on the son. Each knows that it will occur again. Each has to endure it." Unquote. This dream is an interesting combination of the themes of Prometheus, Christ, and modern science. Like Prometheus, the son in the dream is stealing secrets from the father. Like Christ, he is punished by burial and then resurrected. And like a modern scientist, this theft of nature's secrets takes place in a laboratory, i.e. by means of the empirical attitude. The image of Prometheus stealing the divine fire for the benefit of man, then enduring the eternal punishment of being chained to a rock and having his liver fed upon daily by the eagle of Zeus, is central to the enterprise of Western consciousness. Like Tantalus and Sisyphus, Prometheus came into possession of divine secrets. Unlike Tantalus and Sisyphus, Prometheus's acquisition of secret knowledge was deliberate and signifies a willful ego striving for consciousness. At the time of the genesis of the Prometheus myth, perhaps 4,000 years ago, taking on the divine burden was conceived as a crime against God. Now, today, it becomes possible for modern man to open himself to the divine influx for the purpose of serving God rather than stealing from him. Thus, Jung writes in a letter, quote, Can man stand a further increase of consciousness? Is it really worthwhile that man should progress morally and intellectually? Is that gain worth the candle? That's the question. I confess that I submitted to the divine power of this apparently insurmountable problem, and I consciously and intentionally made my life miserable. Because I wanted God to be alive and free from the suffering man has put on him by loving his own reason more than God's secret intentions." Unquote. This statement of Jung's would correspond to Prometheus deciding to steal fire from Zeus, not for the benefit of man, but because Zeus was suffering from the burdensome weight of too much fire and needed human assistance to carry the tormenting load. 
In fact, this is Jung's vision of the nature of things. As he says in the letter to Ellen at Kochning, it can be expected that we are going to contact spheres of not yet transformed God when our consciousness begins to extend into the sphere of the unconscious. And since it is man's task to become more and more conscious, he is therefore drafted into participation in the divine drama of God's transformation. The dream concerns the theme of God's transformation. Father and son refer to God and man, or self and ego. The father's laboratory is the world within and without, the world as nature and the world as history. The son is human consciousness carried by the individual ego, who must make the world an object of knowledge, i.e., steal divine secrets. There is punishment, i.e. pain, accompanying this action. The image of burial in the earth is reminiscent of the Gnostic myth of Sophia's descent into matter whereby light penetrates the darkness. It is a coagulatio symbol which alludes to the process of incarnation. The transpersonal archetypal factor takes on earthiness and is entombed in flesh, i.e. manifests in an individual ego. Just as Prometheus is fixed to the earth by being chained to the rock, so the sun in the dream is buried in the earth. Experientially, this refers to the fact that each new conscious insight carries with it a new responsibility which weighs one down. Awareness is depressing. It buries one in the earth. Nietzsche expresses this fact in his poem, Between Birds of Prey. Quote, Encaved within thyself, burrowing into thyself, heavy-handed, stiff, a corpse, piled with a hundred burdens, loaded to death with thyself, a knower, self-knower, the wise Zarathustra, you sought the heaviest burden and found yourself. As Jung says, the heavy burden the hero carries is himself, or rather the self, his wholeness, which is both God and animal, not merely the empirical man, but the totality of his being, which is rooted in his animal nature and reaches out beyond the merely human towards the divine. Thus, in the above dream, after each theft of a secret, increase of consciousness, the sun is buried in the earth, weighed down with the burden of responsibility that the new consciousness imposes. The dream states that this is a necessary and repeated process. Father and son are parts of a perpetual psychic drama of theft, burial, and resurrection. The purpose of this sequence is the progressive transfer and realization of latent consciousness and responsibility from the father to the son, which is equivalent to the incarnation of God in the human ego. Motivated by the autonomous urge to individuation, the Holy Ghost, the ego must strive to know the self and to realize it consciously. As Jung says, individuation means practically that he, man, becomes adult, responsible for his existence, knowing that he does not only depend on God, but that God also depends on man. In the book of Job, Yahweh says, Behold now behemoth, he is the chief of the ways of God. Job 40, 15, 19, authorized version. And again, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Job 41, 1, 6. Behemoth and Leviathan represent the primordial psyche, what Jung calls the not yet transformed God. According to Jewish legend, the flesh of behemoth and Leviathan will be served at the messianic banquet. A midrash says, quote, In that hour, the Holy One, blessed be he, will set out tables and slaughter behemoth and Leviathan and prepare a great banquet for the pious. And the Holy One, blessed be he, will bring them wine that was preserved in its grapes 
since the six days of creation, and he brings all the fine things of the Garden of Eden." Unquote. The messianic age signifies psychologically the coming of the self, the achievement of the individuation. As the legend puts it, the primordial psyche becomes food for the pious. In other words, it will be transformed and humanized as it is assimilated by the ego under the guidance of the self. Another image of the mastering of Leviathan is found in certain medieval representations, picturing Christ on the cross as the bait of God's fishing line, which catches Leviathan. This is another symbol of the pious ego, which, like Christ, willingly exposes itself to the primordial psyche for the purpose of transforming it. Such an ego is undergoing individuation and is an example of continuing incarnation. Another dream relevant to our subject is that of a woman painter who was in the process of committing herself to her artistic vocation. Quote, I am with a few people and we are suddenly startled to see a gigantic bird overhead. His wing spread is enormous, 20 or 30 feet. As he swoops down low, we are in his awesome shadow. This bird has numbers on his wing, and I know that he belongs to a man who will be very distressed that he has flown away. We must capture him and return him to the man. The bird lands on the ground, not afraid of us. One man picks up his hind hoof and begins tapping the dirt out of it, the way one does to a horse. This hoof is no ordinary hoof. It is inlaid with jewels. That is why it is being cleaned. Later, a freight train comes by, and we are able to load the huge bird aboard the train for his trip home. We have sedated him to make the trip easier, and he is carefully secured." Unquote. The imagery in this dream is related to Gabriel's Annunciation to the Virgin Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy things which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke 1, 35, Authorized Version. The great bird is clearly the Holy Ghost, manifested as the dreamer's creative genius. The dreamer is overshadowed by the awesome bird, just as Mary was overshadowed by the power of the highest. The dream has some interesting variations from the biblical Annunciation. In contrast to the angel Gabriel, the bird is lost and its owner, presumably God, is distressed by its absence. Under the circumstances, human help is needed to capture the bird and to transport it back to its home. This dream has a collective as well as a personal significance. The Holy Ghost, the autonomous transpersonal spirit that connects man with God, has been lost by modern man. Like the Gnostic Sophia, it has fallen into the darkness of matter. This explains the image of the great bird in need of help. Like a member of an endangered species, it must be caught, restrained, sedated, and transported to a more favorable habitat. Asleep and constrained within mortal flesh, the Holy Spirit is being carried to its goal. The dream reverses the usual imagery in which the autonomous spirit is the act of God and inspiration of man. It plays a modern variation on the traditional theme. The Holy Spirit, which has lost its sacred connotations during its descent into matter, must now be rescued by the conscious ego and restored to its rightful connection with God. A later dream by the same woman reveals yet another side of the incarnation phenomenon. Quote, I am standing with a man outside in a city. From a construction site a few blocks away, we suddenly hear an enormous explosion. A huge black metal ring is thrust up into the sky 
by the blast and then comes hurtling back to earth. It is so large that I know its impact wherever it lands will kill many people. We hear the terrible crash and I cry as I feel this sudden tragedy." Unquote. This also can be seen as a collective dream. The explosive emergence of the great black ring represents a collective phenomenon we are currently witnessing, namely the birth of the dark self out of the earthly efforts of man. Ours is a time of great promise and great peril. As the dream indicates, proximity to such an explosive event is dangerous. One may be crushed under the wheel of the juggernaut. The danger is greater the more psychologically naive one is. For us, an adequate knowledge of the psyche is probably a matter of life and death. If the emergent God that wants to be born in man is not humanized and transformed by a sufficient number of conscious individuals, its dark aspect can destroy us. As it gradually dawns on people, one by one, that the transformation of God is not just an interesting idea, but is a living reality, it may begin to function as a new myth. Whoever recognizes this myth as his own personal reality will put his life in the service of this process. Such an individual offers himself as a vessel for the incarnation of deity and thereby promotes the ongoing transformation of God by giving him human manifestation. Such an individual will experience his life as meaningful and will be an example of Jung's statement, quote, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about a Christification of many." Unquote. So that is the end of the book. I urge you to go back five minutes and listen to the ending again and again to completely understand what it is that Dr. Edgeter is saying here. This has been a reading of The Creation of Consciousness, Jung's Myth for Modern Man by Edward F. Edinger. The message on the back cover summarizes part of my issue with the emphasis of Dr. Jordan Peterson. Here's what it says. The Creation of Consciousness. This is a timely and exciting book using religious and alchemical texts, mythology, modern dream, and the concepts of depth psychology, the author proposes nothing less than a new world view, a creative collaboration between the scientific pursuit of knowledge and the religious search for meaning. Religion is based on eros, science on logos. Religion sought linkage with God, science sought knowledge. The age now dawning seeks linked knowledge. The first chapter traces the outlines of a new myth emerging from the life and work of the Swiss psychiatrist C.G. Jung, not another religion in competition with all the others, but rather a psychological standpoint from which to understand and verify the essential meaning of every religion. Chapter 2 discusses the purpose of human life and what it means to be conscious, knowing together with an other. In religious terms, the other is God. Psychologically, it is the self, archetype of wholeness and the regulating center of the psyche. Chapter 3 examines the implications of Jung's master work, Answer to Job, in which Jung demonstrates that God needs man in order to become conscious of his dark side, depth psychology. The new dispensation finds man's relation to what has traditionally been called God in the individual's experience of the unconscious. The final chapter explores Jung's belief that God's moral quality depends on individuals, which translates psychologically into the pressing need for man to become more conscious of his own dark, destructive side as well as his creative potential. This is an important book 
written in the shadow of ominous global forces. Its basic focus on the quality and meaning of individual human lives reflects an underlying concern for the continuation on Earth of any life at all. And then it goes on to describe Dr. Edinger. Dr. Edinger died in 1998. Dr. Edward F. Edinger is a Jungian analyst practicing in Los Angeles, where he teaches at the C.G. Jung Institute. He is the author of Ego and Archetype, Individuation and the Religious Function of the Psyche, and Melville's Moby Dick, a Jungian commentary. His MD is from Yale Medical School. I hope you found this reading of Dr. Edinger's book useful. Thank you for joining me today.